The banality of evil is a unique concept that blends the views of philosophers, historians, and social psychologists to change the way we look at human atrocities. It's easy to think that genocides can only be carried out by sick and twisted minds, by men with no souls and a disdain for humanity. But two events in the early 1960s facilitated a shift in the way Western societies viewed evil. The trial of the Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann and Stanley Milgram's famous shock experiment. In 1961, Eichmann stood trial in Jerusalem, accused of 15 counts. Together with others, he had committed crimes against the Jewish people, crimes against humanity, and war crimes during the whole period of the Nazi regime. He was the architect of the final solution to the Jewish question that led to the murder of millions in Nazi extermination camps. And yet he pled not guilty to all counts, or at least not guilty in the sense of the indictment. In the most famous report on the trial by political philosopher Hannah Arndt, that meant that Eichmann did not see himself as a monster, but as an ordinary bureaucrat following orders. He described himself as unlucky to be a person who held an inferior position who could not shirk his duty, and declared himself a victim, a tool in the hands of stronger powers and stronger forces, and of an inexorable fate. Though even he himself did not object to the horrific results of his actions in hindsight, in his position in that system, he had lost his capacity for moral judgment and simply followed orders. Around the same time, social psychologist Stanley Milgram was conducting his studies of obedience. Essentially, they recruited locals around New Haven, Connecticut to help complete a scientific study of memory and learning for a whopping $4, plus 50 cents in car fare. They were told that they were testing a theory that people learn things more correctly whenever they get punished for making a mistake, like spanking a child to help them remember how to behave, and that their current experiment involved delivering shocks to this nice man, who was strapped into an electric chair to prevent excessive movement. The participants were told explicitly that although the shocks caused no permanent tissue damage, they could be extremely painful. Now, this was all a ruse. The man in the chair was an actor, but it was made to feel real to the participants. With every wrong answer, the actor recorded lines of protest that got louder and more pained as the participant continually increased the voltage of the shock, until a point at which he would refuse to participate further and demand to be let go. At this point, if the participant objected to or questioned the experiment, or simply looked over to the researcher for guidance, they would be politely but firmly prodded along. Please continue. The experiment requires that you continue. You have no other choice. You must go on. Not forced, but simply prodded more and more. Eventually, the shocks reached extreme levels, and the actor went from protesting to screaming to silence as each increasingly deadly shock was delivered. Every single participant was willing to administer intense shocks of 300 volts, and 65% obeyed all of the researchers' requests, including cranking up the voltage into the area that didn't even bother to put numbers on the switches. These two events together complemented each other so well that the second referenced the first, and the synergy between them invoked a new frame of discussion, that evil triumphs because ordinary, decent individuals turn helplessly into monsters when they find themselves in monstrous circumstances, notably when their judgment is subverted by deference to a powerful group. This, to many people, is way more horrifying than the alternative. If evil isn't inherent, if some people aren't simply born with their wires crossed, and that's what makes atrocities like the Holocaust possible, if these things can happen to anyone put under the right pressures, what truly separates us from the monsters we stand against? When it comes time for the ultimate battle between good and evil, will we even be able to tell which side we're on? One of the biggest divides in politics is between personal responsibility and systemic influences. The argument often looks something like this. Someone, usually a conservative but not always, will say, the bad man chose to do the bad thing. Whatever happened in his life that led him up to that point did not force him to act in the way he did. We are not machines devoid of free will, and the responsibility of our own actions ultimately lies at our own feet. To respond to this, someone, usually a lefty but not always, will say, we are products of our environment. Our morality is not inherent, but is instead socially constructed by the culture and norms and values surrounding us. What separates you from the bad man who did the bad thing is time and place, not good or evil. The problem isn't individual people, but the systems they live in. And then these two people will turn towards me to listen with rapturous enthusiasm as I smirk and say, Actually, you're both right, flooring them with my big-brained ability to create two rhetorical arguments on either side of the point I wanted to make. And yes, of course, they clapped. Because these two positions do not contradict each other.
The banality of evil was an important step towards recognizing the all-too-plausible potential for everyday people to rationalize atrocities, but we shouldn't go so far as to dehumanize them in the other direction. Eichmann was indeed a product of his time and country, but he didn't go about the process of mass deportations and, eventually, genocides with the same detached lack of enthusiasm one would have when filling out an Excel spreadsheet. He attacked his job with gusto. He won the approval of his superiors for pioneering new and creative methods of harming other people, and the more work he did, the more his views were transformed. Eichmann had to learn what it meant to be a genocidaire, and then chose to be one. It is a myth that he unthinkingly followed orders. And the participants in Milgram's experiments were not lulled into a catatonic state in which they blindly shocked another human being under the hypnosis of a lab coat. They objected. They questioned the ethics of the experiment. They brought up legal consequences and asked where the trained medical staff were. Even the guys who pushed all the way to the end often showed enormous distress, asking to stop, begging the researcher to check on the man being electrocuted. This is not the agenic state in the presence of a powerful authority defined in the banality of evil. This is purposeful effort against one's own morality to place trust in someone who claims they'll take responsibility. This is active. This is effortful. This is system justification. There's a lot of reductions and claims as to how the mind works out there, most of them by people far smarter than me, so take everything I say with a massive grain of salt, but at its core, the way our mind perceives the world is through differentiation. The key difference between life and non-life is the former's ability to maintain homeostasis, a state in which everything is normal. We have set points for basically all important physiological measures in our body. A temperature, salt concentration, blood sugar, metabolism, you name it. And our sensory system is there to monitor for changes in our internal and external environment based on these set points. We are looking for things that could threaten our survival, and although you have literally billions of sensors in your body being activated at any given time, we're wired to pay attention to novelty and ignore sustained information. After all, if you've been sensing the same smell or touch or sight for long enough, and it hasn't killed you by now, it must not be all that important. Consider the clothes you have on your body right now. If you pay attention, they are indeed activating touch and pressure sensors in your skin, and that information is being sent to your nervous system for processing, but you probably weren't aware of them until just now, because it wasn't important enough to devote conscious resources towards. Basically, we associate normal with safe, because our survival depends on keeping things in a fairly constant state. This extends to more complex processes as well, as even the most cognitively complex thoughts and perceptions we have are hooked into neural mechanisms for basic biological survival. Just like we have organ systems within our body, we exist in social systems outside of it. Quick aside, I'm using Talcott Parsons' definition of social system, as that's the one used by the majority of the research I'll be presenting, which is a network of interactions between actors. Nice and simple. We are social creatures, and we gain a sense of normalcy based on the culture we grew up in, assuming that culture was relatively free of things that threatened your literal survival. Given enough time, no matter how else the system is failing, if you are alive within it, you tend to create set points for normalcy within that social system and will be on the lookout for deviations. And, just like for our internal environment, we associate consistency with safety. As soon as those base physiological needs are met, our next concern is to make sure they are consistently being met, a task made much easier with even a moderately effective social system. What is correct in our society is what is expected. What I'm saying here is that we perceive the world through comparisons. Stress comes from some sort of deviation from those norms, whether it's a very hot day, an unfamiliar shadow outside of your cave, or the implementation of mass restrictive social measures to contain a pandemic. Stress isn't always a bad thing. There's some definite motivational benefits to getting kicked out of complacency, but as I've already discussed in a previous video, we're far more wired to search for threats and negativity than we are anything else. And so, broadly speaking, if something changes in our system, it has to prove itself to be not bad by default. We like predictability because it helps us make better decisions. That means we develop rules, formal and informal, in our heads regarding how society functions to help us get past the uncertainty of dealing with other people. The thing is, we use the same rules to explain things we see in our society by working backwards from those rules. See if any of these cultural values sound familiar to you. A belief in a just world, that people deserve what they get. A belief in personal causation, that what happens to us is the result of our own actions. 
a belief in personal control, that we decide those actions, no one else. These are more or less the norms of individualistic societies, especially America. Under our system, if you work hard and make the right choices, nothing will stop you from getting ahead. It's comforting to know that your future is up to you and you alone. And even if you're not doing well now, you could decide tomorrow that you'll get your act together and make things right. You might have heard about a PragerU video with Jordan Peterson that said as much. In it, he presents a scenario in which a woman hopes that all of her problems are her fault, because it's more comforting to know that she can fix them herself. And it is. Taking control over your life can indeed be comforting. Because you know what would absolutely ruin your perception of a just system in which anyone can succeed if they just work hard? The knowledge that actually a lot of people work hard and don't succeed. And likewise, a lot of successful people were just born lucky. That represents a threat to your social homeostasis, your understanding of how the world works. And so to quote Dr. JP, Inopportune questioning can confuse without enlightening and deflect you from action. When you encounter views from people saying that the system has failed, filter them out in favor of a positive illusion. Work harder in situations where the outcome isn't up to you. Form legitimizing myths and reject information that questions them. You'll feel better, as the video explains. If you do those things, your life will improve. You'll become more peaceful, productive, and desirable. The problem is that these beliefs are often externalized to other people. If we deserve what we get, everyone else does too. If the world is a place where good people are rewarded and bad people are punished, fortunate people must be good and victims must be bad. In a similar shock experiment conducted around the same time as Milgram's, participants in the study were put into two conditions. One, where they could voluntarily switch the victim from a shock punishment system to a money reward system, and one where they had no choice and the victim would just continue to suffer the shock punishment. Virtually all subjects in the former condition chose the reward system, and those that did rated the victim more favorably than those in the latter condition, in which the victim would continue to suffer. If the victim had to continue suffering the shocks, she must somehow deserve such a fate. Likewise, as news of the persecution of Jews by Eichmann and his ilk in Nazi Germany made it over to the United States, surveys conducted at the time didn't elicit sympathy towards the victims. Far from it. Instead, there was a rise in anti-Semitism. They must have done something to deserve it, if the belief in a just world was to continue. As far as the meat sacks that are our bodies are concerned, perception is reality. Jordan Peterson up there is definitely right about one thing. You can change the way you view the world to make yourself feel better. So if the system isn't justified, you can simply justify the system. As far as your brain is concerned, they're the same thing. System justification theory was first proposed in 1994 by doctors John Jost and Mazarin Banaji to describe the psychological processes contributing to the preservation of existing social arrangements, even at the expense of personal and group interest. According to the theory, people are motivated to defend the existing status quo because it serves the palliative function of easing underlying epistemic, existential, and relational needs to reduce feelings of uncertainty. It's basically, don't worry, it's all in God's plan, as an instruction manual, which is why religious people are more likely to do it. What makes this theory interesting to me is that this process isn't involuntary or inevitable. People want to believe that the existing social system is legitimate and justified. Unlike most of our bodily functions we do to maintain internal homeostasis, system justification is motivated and goal-directed. People do it because they want to, not because they're helpless to stop it. And they want to do it because placing trust in the system takes a huge burden off your shoulders, even if it comes at the expense of not exploring better options. 25 years later, Jost published a paper laying out the five lines of evidence to support the idea that system justification is a motivated, goal-directed process. One. The endorsement of system-justifying beliefs, including beliefs associated with political conservatism, is linked to individual differences in self-deception and motivated social cognition. Wage growth has lagged far behind productivity growth for 30 years now, resulting in massively ballooning income inequality that could not reasonably be explained by some people just working that much harder. But through the 90s and 2000s, most Americans still thought that the economic system was fair. A 1999 Gallup poll showed that more than two-thirds of Americans thought that the economic situation in the United States was basically fair. Thankfully, that's flipped here in 2020, but we arguably wouldn't be in this mess if we'd enacted the right policies when inequality was in the midst of spiraling out of control. 
The short answer is that people are really good at self-deception, and it's far less stressful to trick yourself into thinking things are just fine than it is to acknowledge that the game was rigged from the start. A very tiny percentage of the top 1% believe that coming from a wealthy and well-educated family is important for getting ahead, despite ample evidence showing that wealthy families overwhelmingly tend to raise wealthy children into wealthy adults, and that it can take five to six generations for a single family's descendants to be completely free of their economic influence. Wealthy people have a vested interest in maintaining this legitimizing myth, because inequalities need to be justified unless you want an uprising of thousands knocking on your door to question why you get to be on that side of it. A belief in the system of meritocracy can work backwards to explain contradictory conclusions. You need to keep working hard if you want to make it big like me. Though you've worked hard your entire life and never made it out of poverty, well, at least you're creating a better life for your kids, even though I just told you that my parents being rich had nothing to do with my success. 2. People often respond defensively to threats, criticisms, and challenges directed at the overarching social system. Research has shown that it's way easier to ascribe malicious motivations to someone making an argument against the status quo. If someone upsets your understanding of the world, which is heavily shaped by the environment you grew up in, your first impulse is to discredit the argument or the person making it in order to restore that understanding. Stereotyping is ideal for this. When a system is characterized by the separation of people into roles, classes, positions, or statuses, we tend to create stereotypes of those categories to justify and explain why some people are at the top and other people are at the bottom. Poor people are lazy losers with low IQs, and rich people are rich because they work hard and work smart. Wait, no, fuck. Note that these stereotypes are formed after the fact, in accordance with a belief that the system works for everybody. Completely different groups across cultures often share the same stereotype contents because they feed so perfectly off each other. I remember presenting some years ago to students in Oxford a set of adjectives. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're not going to try next time. I remember presenting some years ago to students in Oxford a set of adjectives mentioned to me at the time by Jezernik as typical of the Slovene characterizations of immigrant Bosnians. When the students were asked where these descriptions came from and to whom they applied, the unanimous guess was that they were the stereotypes used about colored immigrants in England. Stereotypes serve the dual role of justifying why certain groups of people are lagging behind in a supposedly egalitarian society, while also making the stereotyper feel better about themselves. Most stereotypes are negative, because such characterizations allow for evaluations of the group that can be used for later self-affirmation. 3. System-justifying processes exhibit several classic properties of goal pursuit. Recall your body's need for stability, that prime directive to maintain homeostasis. System justification satisfies three important goals to that effect. 1. It gives us a stable, predictable worldview to produce uncertainty. 2. It gives us the perception of a safe, reassuring environment to manage threat levels. And perhaps most importantly, 3. It's far easier to relate to the people closest to us when they share the same goals within the same reality. The first two are basically just extensions of the palliative effects you get when you stop worrying and learn to love the boot, but that last one has some serious implications for anyone pushing for social change. The whole point of a status quo is to be the common ground we all share. Challenging that system is about more than just ideas. It puts the relationships we build within that system at risk. A great example is the coming out process for queer people, where some of us face real physical danger upsetting the embedded scripts of those around us on top of the isolation and apprehension we experience from not sharing some key common grounds with our peers. Hell, bisexuals are too often perceived to upset both gay and heteronormative systems, and the potential loss of love and support is bad enough coming from one community, let alone two. Now, not all marginalized people struggle against the system, but we'll tackle that in a bit. 4. People engage in selective, biased information processing to reach system-supporting conclusions. Let's talk about the American dream for a second. If you work hard, you'll succeed, plain and simple. All the work you're doing, whether it's studying hard to get your degree or putting in extra hours at your job, keep it up because that's how you get ahead. It's what you've been taught your whole life, and even if you are aware of other ways to structure society, this is the one you have access to and where all of your eggs are laid. Every step you've taken to better your life has depended on that axiom being true. If someone threatens that axiom, either by telling you it isn't true, or that it's part of a system causing untold harm to the planet and most of the people on it, especially if they have solid evidence to back it up, you really have two options. Step back and reconsider how you approach decisions in the future with a newfound skepticism of the assumptions you've been led to believe your entire life, coming up with an entirely new system to guide you that clashes with the one nearly every other person you meet or care about is using, or 
say, fuck that, double down because you're not an idiot, and if you believe that working hard on the path you're already on is the way to get ahead, then that's the way it is. Climate change can't be real, let alone caused by humans, because that would mean our economic system is faulty. Racism can't be real, let alone happening today, because I don't feel bad about being white. Millennials can't afford houses. They must be too lazy to work, because it can't be the system at fault. Naive realism is a theory which says that people assume that they see things as they really are, that their take on the world is authentic, and that anyone who disagrees either just doesn't know the facts or must have some sort of malicious intent. I've used this example to describe someone else in the past, uh, but I think it applies here. It's not that my arguments are rational because they follow one another and are backed by data. It's, I'm rational, and therefore my arguments are good and backed by data. Otherwise, how would I have thought them for so long? 5. People are willing to expand behavioral effort in order to maintain the legitimacy of the socioeconomic system. Several studies show that when primed even a little bit with a reminder of our supposed system of meritocracy, people will work harder when they've been explicitly told that the task was entirely based on luck. There's an old adage that's sometimes attributed to Thomas Jefferson that goes something like, the harder I work, the more luck I have. I think it's supposed to mean that you create your own opportunities, but apparently people are out there on some heart of the cards bullshit and take it to literally mean that the universe will reward you if you believe in yourself. Wait a minute, did you just summon a bunch of monsters in one turn? Yeah, so? That's against the rules, isn't it? Screw the rules, I have money. If all of this sounds like a needlessly complicated explanation for political conservatism to you, you're half right. The core ideology of conservatism stresses resistance to change and the justification of inequality, and so it's a very good fit for the motivated reasoning we've been going over with system justification theory. However, times change, and with them, the ideology of the seats in power. In the 2016 election, general system justification was slightly more closely associated with support for Hillary Clinton, the more mainstream and less disruptive candidate, and Trump supporters rejected the liberal status quo under President Obama. So does that mean that conservatism really is the new punk rock, sticking it to the man and rebelling against authority? No, obviously not. General system justification may have been in favor of Clinton, but Trump supporters, like political conservatives in general, strongly justified economic and gender-specific systems and disparities. They may have been frustrated by the economic consequences under global capitalism, but not the system itself. This right here is why system justification was first proposed all those years ago. It makes sense that people in power want to keep it, that rich people want you to think they earned their wealth, that white people want to ignore racism to avoid culpability. What doesn't make sense, at least at first, is why those under the boot would grow to love the stitching. People in power are, generally, still human and are thus susceptible to the negative emotions us humans experience when we see others suffering. System justification assuages those feelings of guilt and helps to maintain a positive self-image in the face of rampant wealth inequality and global poverty caused by the policies that make the powerful powerful in the first place. Sympathy is fine. You can feel bad for the downtrodden. You can recognize the plight of black people or LGBT people or the global poor. That's just basic human emotion. But guilt is unacceptable. Not only because it's a negative feeling for the individual, but because existential guilt, not sympathy, predicts a willingness to engage in actionable social change. One way or another, that guilt must be assuaged. Which is nothing compared for the needs of actual victims of injustice to find some way of dealing with a system that has failed them. The other major predictor of actionable social change was moral outrage, and those in power need to find a way to quash that quickly if they want to remain legitimate in the eyes of a numerically superior force of have-nots. They can't do that through power alone. The material cost is too high. A system needs to be in place which facilitates the subordinate classes following authority voluntarily. System justification theory is partially grounded in the Marxian idea of false consciousness. In a class society, Marx asserted that social mechanisms would emerge to systematically create distortions, errors, and blind spots in the consciousness of the underclass. System justification theory was initially developed to explain why members of disadvantaged groups often, but not always, exhibited outgroup favoritism by expressing more positive attitudes about other groups that are higher in status or power than their own. Poor and middle class people tend to favor the rich. Many, but certainly not all, black Americans evaluate white people more favorably than black people, and many LGBT people trick themselves into believing society is fair by simply ignoring evidence that it isn't. 
Minimizing, as opposed to acknowledging, the extent to which your group is the target of discrimination permits the false belief that the system is fair and legitimate, and that you have an equal chance to succeed within it. This false consciousness has a myriad of benefits when it comes to subjective well-being, and this palliative effect is especially strong among those for whom the threat of experiencing discrimination is highest. When you combine this feel-good mythologizing against your own discrimination with the backlash you'll receive if you rock the boat by calling it out, is it any wonder why people like Candace Owens or Blair White or Brandon Straka exist? They're often called grifters because, of course, there's a ton of money to be made in assuaging the guilt of the average person within the status quo, both from the people in power who need them to be complicit and from the people themselves who want to hear it. But I think there's more to it than that. Grifting implies that they don't believe what they say, that they're intentionally lying on behalf of their financial benefactors and drown their guilt with money. But as I've hopefully demonstrated, there's a powerful incentive for them to genuinely believe the drivel they spiel. Yes, positive illusions that promote well-being for the individual come at the cost of society. Yes, justifying inequalities often results in stereotyping or outright dehumanization of people suffering at the bottom. And yes, ignoring mountains of evidence contrary to your worldview leads to anti-intellectualism and the rejection of a shared reality based on empirical observation in favor of one giving post-hoc rationalizations for existing power structures. But homeostasis for the individual has been achieved. A just world willed into perception is a just world to the perceiver all the same. People are not sheep, and it's dangerous and incorrect from any political perspective to think so. Likewise, existing evidence is not sufficient to warrant the notion that hierarchy and inequality are genetically mandated at either the individual or the species level. The only constant for humanity is that we are adaptable. And we have enormous capacities to accommodate, internalize, and even rationalize features of our socially constructed environments. None of this video was meant to imply that systems are always bad, or that justifying them is always evil. A status quo offers a shared reality and a common cultural language to foster better communication and cooperation with the people around us. The goal of any real social justice movement is not to reject a system for the sake of it, but to replace that system with a better one. Those of us on the left are always, always, fighting an uphill battle, not only against powerful actors working to maintain the structures that put them there in the first place, but the widespread intolerance of uncertainty that builds and maintains those structures. Burnout among activists is incredibly common, and the default, fuck it, I give up position is a conservative one. And that's because progressing society in a good direction is a matter of many small but consistent changes over a long period of time. There's a joke I used to tell as a personal trainer. If you want big arms, the best way to get them is to curl 100 pounds in each hand because you can't move that much weight without big biceps to back it up. It reduces the process to a single action and ignores the much harder and more complicated process of lifting day in and day out for years to get there, which is why it's a joke. That siren call of not going to the gym in favor of eating cheddar popcorn in front of your third watch through of the office at home, justifying it because you're tired and missing one workout won't hurt, echoes the frustrations of system justification theory. It's much harder to advocate for the uncertainty of progress than it is for the comfort of a flawed system. And if the only solution you see is to start with a 100 pound dumbbell of overthrowing the system, something is going to snap. Fascism prevails when faith in a system is shaken and an alternatively simple and comforting option is presented. It has the benefit of appealing to a heavily mythologized previous status quo that scapegoats the powerless as both the reason for the current system's failures and the cause for the righteous indignation of the good citizen who played by the rules while making use of existing professions comprised of people high in both system justification and social dominance, like police officers. Simply put, if we take a burn-it-all-down approach and just hope that the socialist utopia will spring up from the ashes, the fascists will win. You can cringe if you want to, but social systems are not like operating systems. You can't just uninstall one and replace it with another. A 47-year-old consultant from Idaho is not going to have their hard drives wiped with a pulse and relearn only the values of the new system we now somehow all decided to use. Instead of a Windows for PC approach, we should think more along the lines of Boards for Theseus. Political authorities and institutions lose their legitimacy when they're found to go against the rules of the system they claim to represent. The failure of a system is determined by the values already within it, so changes to that system must, in some way, appeal to it. Police reform is on the table now because a ton of people went out and protested a system that failed to live up to justice for all. 
LGBT rights have come as far as they have because a ton of people were disruptive when pointing out their lack of individual liberties. Wealth inequality is finally starting to really clash against the idea that how much money you make is determined by how hard you work because it's been forced into the spotlight by people pushing it there. There's a wonderful quote from the late, great Michael Brooks. Be ruthless with systems, be kind to people. But systems are people. Just like Eichmann and the participants of the Milgram experiment weren't husks of a system with no agency in their actions, we too play a role in the direction and character of the systems we live in. Systemic problems are changed or maintained by individual actions. So any critique of a helpful step towards solving one problem that amounts to not addressing the larger system is kind of missing the point. No, your vote will not overthrow global capitalism in the same way that planting a single tree will not repopulate an entire forest. We, rightfully, and with mountains of evidence on our side, criticize conservatives for ignoring the systemic roots of many of society's problems to place blame solely on individual actions, fine and good. The problem is when you take that to mean that no step is big enough to matter until you reach a scale that's impossible to achieve. Overthrowing the system is not a thing you can do because the system is not a thing. It's the amalgamation of every interaction between every actor within it. Every vote, every conversation, every purchase, every body at every protest, every shit post on Twitter is part of a social system. And every big change you see within it stands atop thousands of unseen but crucial minute interactions at its foundation. Whatever system you'd like to see in the future is being determined by what you are doing right now. Good triumphs when ordinary, decent individuals forego the path of least resistance in favor of building something better. Thank you everyone who made it to the end of this video, and thank you double if you actually are one of the very few people who actually watch these little end plates. Uh, I have all my references on the screen right now. A ton of research went into this video, so uh, in the very likely event that you can't see those, I do have the full reference list down in the description, linked in a Google document, just in case it doesn't fit. Uh, do the normal YouTube stuff. Please leave a like on this video. Uh, subscribe if you would like to. You can follow me on Twitter at SJWDebates. And if you're super cool, you can join these nice people in supporting me on Patreon. So I'd like to thank my patrons Edward Normal, Benick G. Spicer, Spoop, Brian Lemer, Gavin Pittard, Leonard Mathieson, Bearded Cuban, Deborah Goldsmith, Casey Explosion, Wait, I'm Curious, Only Slightly, and Sam. Thank you very much, and I will hopefully get out more videos uh, at a better pace in the near future.